Giles, Ryan, welcome uh, to the 42 Quarters podcast. What an honour uh, to see you on this glorious Thursday morning. It's very overcast here and I'm imagining evening uh, where you are in Australia, right? <laughs> nice turn. Yeah, yeah, thank you but for having prob- us. Probably nice, nice and warm where you are though still, I'd imagine. Uh, warmish, yeah, no, it's getting warm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Melbourne, what's, really, that what's warm for you, Ryan? Go on, show up. Uh, I think it's about 25 today. No, oh, <laughs> fuck this. Yeah. Perfect temperature. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're here today to talk about uh, Ryan and Giles' amazing new book, How Brands Blow. Uh, very cool title. Um, <laughs> I love the play on words with that. Have you had a call from Byron yet uh, to <laughs> to compliment you on your <laughs> nah. choice of title? Are it's we... a story, though. There was a bit of a story behind that, actually. Um, we had when when we when I first announced it on LinkedIn, which must have been God knows what a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, some guy popped up and said, "Oh, you know, are you are, are you proud of the fact that you are using borrowed interest <laughs> from how brands grow?" And I was like, uh, <laughs> "Yeah, pretty much." <laughs> and then Byron actually, well, I I contacted Byron and said. I uh, just want to make sure that you're okay with this. And he said, yeah, yeah, that's all fine. So, <laughs> I think nice. we've got his blessing. Yeah. And, um, and this is, this yeah, is funny, uh, three both independently came up with the same title, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <Great. Wow. laughs> that's nice. Some time. Mm. <laughs> Bravo. And yeah, how did the collaboration start? Um, I mean, you're both very, very far apart from each other location wise. Um, what, how did this? How did this marriage came apart? Uh, came come apart? Not come apart. How did this marriage come together? Ah, uh, you can answer that one if you like, Charles. <laughs> yeah. How did it come together? I don't know the correct answer, but it's, I mean, I I think Ryan and I had certainly followed each other on the bin fire that is now X, and um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, I mean, Chris, you'll know this as well. That things happen and spark from Twitter, uh, the Twitter yeah. world that then develop whether that's like i don't know people's relationships or like within marketing twitter which i think quite fairly mm. gets a lot of criticism there's also a lot of love and some good things that have spiraled out of that and i and i mm. genuinely think it was a fairly off the cuff comment from mm. Ryan about start thinking about putting a book together and i remember mm. pouncing on it quite quick and saying yeah i'm in let's do it and I did something along those lines yeah no that was pretty <laughs> much it yeah i remember getting a message from you and then and you said, oh, yeah, I'm in. I was like, okay, well, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And 500 so years later, around. here we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what, yeah. I mean, how, yeah, had you ever made a book before, Giles, or was this sort of just a, a like, screw it, let's do it moment? Yeah, it's more, it's more the latter. I feel like it should be the former, but it's, it's definitely the latter. <laughs> I, it, and, and I think the reason why we wanted to is, um, I I was going through a phase or still going through a phase perhaps where like amplifying people who I massively admired and who spoke well and spoke, you know, what needed to be said um, was, was like a little mission that we were going on as, as a business, as an agency. So obviously with our own, with the podcast Call to Action where we do that and books to me just seemed like a, a nice way to explore doing the same thing in a different medium i've always loved books like print design is my background so um i'm a bit of a sucker for books it's certainly as we might come on to later there's no real money in books unless you're you know (laughs) writing about wizards um (laughs) but like putting books together has always been something i've been interested in and, and it's increasingly become accessible and easy to do. Like the barriers to entry are, you know, probably lower than mm-hmm. they have been for a while, perhaps, uh, with self-publishing routes. We've actually avoided the self-publishing route altogether now, so we don't even do it that way. But at the time, it was an option that we thought we'd explore, and that's kind of how it came to be. And so, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Delusions of Branger was your first, the first book that you published. Yeah, first. Is that wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then. And then obviously Gasp has done quite a few since then. So, yeah. 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 We've done copywriting is uh, with Andrew Bolton. Um, we've collaborated on Adele writes an ad, which funnily enough, Byron Sharp ordered a hundred copies of, which pretty much <laughs> double, sales, double sales of that book. Um, 
Yeah. And now nice. how brands blow. Yeah, it's amazing. Love it. It is a it is a fabulous book. If you uh, what I liked about it is probably similar to the first one as well. It's this nice balance of of having a laugh, but also there's some real wonderful nuggets of wisdom in that. So it's sort of this this it takes you on this nice journey of sort of humor, but then also actually educating you. Um, but uh, yeah, how how did this one come about? What was the the need for the for the second? It's absolutely fantastic book. Your time, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> need might be a bit too strong a word, but um, I think well, even even after the first book, I sort of I still had quite a lot of material that I'd built up, and uh, and I don't know. I think Giles and I started talking about it only maybe I don't know six months after the first one, right. about whether we were going to do a sequel and. Um, and, and then I sent him a whole lot of stuff, uh, a couple of years ago <laughs> and then we uh, sort of had it in the, in the works for a while. But, um, but since then we sort of, I've added quite a lot to it as well. So, and, and a lot of it, I think is probably some of the better stuff. So it's lucky that we didn't get it out too, <laughs> too quickly. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, was there anything in particular in it that you, that you found sort of, that you really, really loved writing or anything that you found a little bit difficult in it? Well, we actually both wrote different pieces in it. Um, but personally speaking, uh, the, well, the one piece that I remember sort of chuckling to myself about was the copywriter's dream, which was the one where, you know, some, this, this guy wakes up and sort of lives the perfect day and then, yeah. uh, and then suddenly wakes up to realise that it's all a nightmare. Um, because I think I, I'd almost woken up with it in my head somehow and, um, yeah, and just sort of came together. But So that was an easy one. But in terms of, um, yeah, things that I didn't like, I mean, I, it's all been stuff that I have enjoyed writing. Like I, I write, I like writing satirical pieces and I like writing blog pieces and all that sort of stuff. Um, but having said that, some of the, some of the satirical work, has definitely been born of annoyance. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, something that I'm particularly annoyed about that in the industry that sort of, you know, makes me react to it. Uh, so I guess in some ways, you you know, I'd say that I wouldn't, didn't enjoy that so much. But then, yeah. you know, how you can think about, so there's a, there's one piece that I did, which was quite a few years ago now, um, which was the rewrite of the lemon ad, kind of in the style yes. of modern copywriting, um, yeah. which I think was kind of written in anger, to be honest. <laughs> but yeah. If there are so many of those words in the book where, where you, uh, yeah, where you, you, you sort of, you go, you relate to so much of it if you work in advertising. So, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for pouring out uh, some of, some of the, the, the blood, sweat and tears into the pages. Uh, yeah. Uh, Charles, yeah, I think that's that. a key point, Chris, about recognizing yeah. it. The, yeah. the duck, sorry to cut you off. The, the duck hunting's uh, piece in here is, to me, one of the finest bits of writing I've ever read. It's just like it's so it's so uh, unapologetically and perfectly Ryan. It's so satirical. <laughs> it's so witty and it's so true. And and I think some of the like I'm I'm always mindful talking or when we're you know having discussions about anything that's satirical, which is kind of like a brother to cynicism sometimes or too easily that it's seen as a as just a criticism. But I think that. I, I, I think, and I'm sort of preempting any kind of, I, I suppose, criticism the book might get from people who thinks it is over, think it is overly cynical. That if it's funny and you get the joke, then it's not a criticism just for the sake of criticism. Like it's, it's almost like for it to be funny, it has to also be true. So it's like a, a reflection yeah. of what is happening in the industry. It doesn't mean to say you think the industry has gone to pot. I think far from it. There's a lot of hope. Uh, in the industry and I think there's definitely a, an amazing comeback for creativity um, that we're witnessing and there's loads of people fighting the fight on the front line further ahead than you know Ryan and I can claim to be so I think that it's worth mentioning that it's worth mentioning that it is is done for the right reasons and it's done because it's true right we can laugh at it but also not be negative and I, yeah, and I think one I of the points it. to to that point, one of the points that I've made before is that I think it's um, the purpose of that kind of satirical writing is that it allows you to punch with a, vel a velvet glove. You know, you don't yeah. have to be openly aggressive about 
sort of the way that you approach this criticism. And I think it, if you can do it in an entertaining way, that it, you know, I think it makes it more approachable, basically. Well, that's the intention. It reminds, yeah. it reminds me a lot of your, your tweets, um, which are always hilarious and a kind of, um, yeah, it's beautiful sort of lighthearted, uh, t- tongue in cheek, self deprecating humor. It's, uh, been, I think it's done in a really nice way. Like, I, I yeah, I mean, I loved it. So, so bravo. I think it's, when, I mean, I, I guess this is the perfect book for anyone really in, in advertising or marketing. It's sort of, uh, again, it's that, that nice balance of the practical, but also of the, of the having a laugh and, and taking the piss out of, out of some of the crazy decisions that are made. And, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, what, what are some of the more, um, yeah. crazy things that you've seen recently, Ryan, that, that, that have, uh, that have, <laughs> that, have, that have got you going, oh my word, what, what, what on earth was going on? Uh, I mean, as a bit of an enduring trope, I guess, there's this kind of idea of ad agencies working at the speed of culture and, and sort of various, you know, modifications of that term, which I just find nauseating. Um, you know, I really object to the idea that advertising should be, I don't know, at the forefront of whatever is happening in culture. I just don't think that that is necessary and and I think sort of harking back to Birnbach's um, simple timeless human truths is much more what we should be focusing on and I think we've kind of lost sight of that to a, to a large extent um, yeah and you know I suppose tied in with that the whole obsession with you know the latest thing and AI recently obviously um, which seems to have died down a bit <laughs> fortunately um, but you know all that sort of stuff that just becomes a fad for a while and quickly gets forgotten and, and, you know, we sort of move on to the next thing. So, you know, I, obviously that's a lot of the focus in the book as well. Um, and I'm sure that Charles would agree with that. Yeah. I think, um, it's almost, I think there's a misconception or a misunderstanding that we're going to somehow get past the kind of delusions that are so evident in the industry but there's always one ready to replace the one you're trying to replace and trying to move past and improve wrong so there's there's so many you can um there's so many you could use i'm i'm constantly finding or hearing new terms which are just for the thing that already exists but they've rebadged it and i don't know whether it's i mean people love to, are talking a lot now about uh, b2b influencers uh, specifically in the context of the ceo of a, of a of a business is an influencer but i don't know when that wasn't always true right um so there's there's things that are kind of getting rebadged and given a bit of polish and just chucked out into the the you know the the industry rhetoric as if it's like wow this new sparkly thing but actually if you look under that new sparkly thing it's just a what well, a timeless truth i suppose to nick Ryan's already stolen brilliant words. <laughs> Ray Stalin. <laughs> Which yeah. it is. But it's just a funhouse mirror. I think the other thing to talk about or to, or to flag is that we're not saying we're immune to it either. Like I look back, we've been running 14 years and I look back at some of the conversations. And yes. In fact, I looked back at a pitch deck that we produced about, thank you, about 10 years ago. And honestly, I was embarrassed to be me <laughs> because I remember writing a slide in there thinking, my God, did I really believe that at the time? So my, this, uh, I think Tom Fish. Tom Fishburne, marketoonist, uh, said we were holding up a funhouse mirror to the silliness of, of modern marketing. And I, I think that just articulates it so well. And we're not saying that we can't see ourselves in the mirror. I'm yeah, definitely absolutely. There. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. You know, we're, we're caught up in it as well. Um, yeah. How do, I mean, you, you run an agency, Charles. Like, how do you... Yeah, you know, do you do you give your 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 team some of the classics to to read so they get those foundational stuff or like how do you how do you temper the the the, the hype around it all? Temper is a good word, um, <laughs> inappropriate. We we so we used to um, we've stopped doing it for some reason since the pandemic, but I am hoping to introduce it. In fact, we have on our, our most recent hire. We used to prescribe if that's the right word a few industry books and asked that they were read in the first weeks of someone joining the industry. Um, we do, uh, we frequently talk to clients about the timeless classics. We've reprinted the wonderful uh, JWT Stephen King's planning guide. Yeah. Um, we had that 
photocopy that does the rounds. We had it transcribed and reprinted it, and we give that to clients and say, look, this isn't ours, but this is this is worth um, understanding and worth reading. I'm I I rarely um, I rarely stop banging on about some of the late greats. Um, and I think that's all you can really hope to do. Um, yeah, certainly Jeremy Bullmore, the late great Jeremy Bullmore. I'm, I'm constantly asking people to read his his articles, and it's and it's it's funny, Chris, because the the sentiment behind why I do that is true of just marketing knowledge and those timeless truths, as much as it is to say something as seemingly trivial as a brief template. Um, and I've I've taught uh, elsewhere about the two templates from I think 1960s uh, and 1970s respectively, the BBH and JWT briefs, which to me, it would be a waste of time for us as an agency to try to improve them because far smarter people have already reached the conclusion with their template. And actually we're probably better off spending our time on actually doing the work instead of <laughs> speculating about whether we can make one of the questions in a brief better. And I think that's the, that's the thing that needs addressing. Totally agree. And I mean, Ryan, what are some of the your yeah? You know, when you try and look back at the at the greats, who, who are the people that you go to for your for your wisdom? Apart from Giles, um, I mean, uh, well, <laughs> apart from Giles, yeah. Uh, I usually hug back to well, Ben Backer. I've already mentioned, um, you know, all the kind of the classics, Ogilvy and the and the great copywriters, David Abbott. Um, we, I, well, till fairly recent, we've got, obviously we've got How Browns Blow, uh, Blow, How Browns Grow, the original, uh, at work <laughs> and, you know, make sure that everyone, basically everyone who comes into the agency understands, you know, has read those, those books. Um, mm. uh, How to Write Better Copy by Steve Harrison. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, they're kind of the classics really. Cool. Cool to do a gasp series of these, uh, Giles, and you'd like a sort of uh, re reprint or something like a, a little uh, collection series, perhaps uh, for for an excellent bit. Um, anyway, sorry, back to the book, Ryan. Ryan you're saying that you that you um, you delayed launching it by uh, by a little while. Uh, was that what what were you what were you waiting to put in? What was the the extra stuff uh, you're saying that no, I wasn't waiting to put in anything. Was... I was waiting for Giles to design it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, okay. Yeah, no, Ryan, it is lovely design. Did you delay it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it is beautiful. Yeah, that's, like, that's all not me. Yeah, it is. Everything it really is. is. I mean, yeah. It. yeah, I love it. It's it's worth yeah. it's worth me crediting Giles at the moment for that because it does look amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah he did an amazing job. Um, but yeah, no, it just happened that because it was delayed, I, I had managed to write a few things in the intervening time. So, uh, so it's fortunate. <laughs> yeah. Close. Yeah. It was, a bit of a, um, it was a bit of a Game of Thrones. Who's the Game of Thrones author where everyone's like panics about whether he'll still be around long enough to finish the book. <laughs> Got to that stage, didn't it? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um, no, you're right. You know, <laughs> Well, well, can I say on that, Chris? I actually about a, about a year ago, I changed the background on my phone to be the cover of the book, <laughs> so that every anyway. time I looked at my phone during the day, it would remind me to get the hell on with finishing the book. I'm not, oh, I didn't know that. But, well, That's good. Well, congrats, yeah. congrats on making it. Um, and it it's uh, it's out on the 11th, so um, by the time this this airs, I think uh, it'll be it'll be available at all good and bad bookshops everywhere. Um, and uh, and online, I, I see you can always already get your uh, Amazon orders in. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's it's such a fun book. Um, yeah, I mean, what 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 have you got a next project lined up already? Um, I mean, if they take this long, you might as well get started now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know if I'll be alive to see it. Fair. Very uh, fair. That's fair. I, I'm, I'm out of material now, so I'm going to have to start working on it if we're going to. Well, I think there's some spin-offs, right? I mean, Ryan and I have loosely spoken about a few spin-off things, whether it's merchandise or what, that could True. easily fall out of the book. So I think we can have fun with that without maybe, you know, trying to achieve another Putting book. Putting too much effort. Any, any yeah. Time. yeah. Yeah. 
Well, what is some of your? I mean, you, you, yeah. the book's full of loads of bits of, of fun things as well as lots of bits of advice. I mean, what are, what are some of your favorite bits of advice that you that you like to share uh, with your teams? Either, either, either you can go first. <laughs> yeah, you can tie that one first, mate. <laughs> I yeah, I I mean, oh, there's I mean, there's so much in in it. Like you probably just pick a random page to be honest. I think <laughs> I think it it. There's there's things that I've things that I've realised in in trying to run an agency or a business, a group of creative people, and I don't claim to be great at doing that by the way. But there's a few things yeah. I've noticed that people often need permission to laugh about things in the industry. So unless they think someone perhaps more senior or whatever, however you want to kind of articulate the, the natural hierarchy that exists whenever you put a few humans in a room. Um, they always need permission to laugh about things and dismiss things. And I think the book dismisses everything from redesigning a logo for the sake of keeping it fresh to having another meeting for the sake of having a meeting. All these things that all businesses are probably guilty of to some degree but we all go along with it until someone has the metaphorical balls to say, actually, this is a bit ridiculous, isn't it? And actually to call it out. So I think the book calls out so many things and Ryan's brilliant at calling things out without being like too white, wildly critical in a fun way. And I think that's the biggest thing for me. Like if you just look at the agendas in here, whether you're talking about brand positioning and people just going overboard on, I don't know how much they might think consumers love their products all sorts there's so many chris and i think that's the thing to me it's the one the one core to it all is just like giving permission for people to to laugh at it and say actually this is why are we doing this why are we sat around a table talking about this it's daft uh, yeah well thanks man <laughs> you're right yeah that's probably i mean that is a, a thread definitely um i mean if i if i had to think of a specific example. There, there's an article, or it was a blog originally that I wrote about um, a campaign here in the in Australia for the BCF brand, which is boating, camping, fishing, and and sort of I tried to break yeah. it down into, you know, what what made it an effective campaign and and what kind of specifically made it different from the classic kind of ad industry darling campaign and you know you know, sort of a, a typical award winning um, ad. And I Can think the they, I, I've actually used, yeah, BCFing fun. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, so I, and I've actually, Terrible. I've used that in, <laughs> I've spoken to, you know, the people at my agency about it and, and I've used it in a couple of presentations that I've given as well as, a, you know, as an example that a very sort of tangible example of, of why an ad like that works and why it's effective and why that's the sort of, work that we should really be striving for rather than sort of, you know, going after awards. But, but having said that, it's very difficult to, to kind of get that message across to, to, to people who, you know, where it might actually skewer your career in, in a, in a sense, which is where I think, you know, people like Giles and I are probably at an advantage because of the fact that we work for, you know, a small, small independent agency. We're not sort of beholden to that kind of, you know, having to be chasing after awards and, and so on all the time. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a great piece of work, and it and it, I I love Steve Harrison would love it, I'm sure as well, and that it it actually has the name in the in the tagline, so at least you know who it's for as yeah. well. It's, you know, very very yeah, memorable, exactly. Um, yeah, it'd be nice yeah, if more, really, more yeah, campaigns. It's been, like it's been running for years. Well, yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, what what have you got any of your other sort of uh? uh Long, best like most favorite long running campaigns that use that same sort of theme i guess in the uk would it be what like uh compare the market or something like the meerkats I and mean, that's been going for forever as well not necessarily the most creative or yeah. interesting stuff but incredibly effective everyone knows who it is yeah yeah well um, uh, well giles and i both yeah. well we used that example in the talk that we gave a couple of years ago um and that runs here as well Although I probably probably yeah. not quite as, yeah, it's the don't think it has the same saturation. But what's the what's the dad that you used that you that your mum loves or your mum hates <laughs> and remembers? What's it called? Geo tests. Yeah, yeah. Comparia. Yeah, the go Gym. compare ads. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I think her quote was her quote was 
along the lines of I hate that hate guy, it. but when I need car insurance, yeah. I can't stop thinking of him or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Mm. And that's all you need. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, that's it's not it's yeah. not rocket science, but we we do a good job at often trying to make it rocket science. Um, but I think that's exactly. that's sort of yeah yeah you, you you often in larger agencies I guess you maybe you, you often try and justify your pricing or justify your position in an agency so you try and make things overly complicated so that it makes your position more safe I think you see that a lot in other industries as well probably in banking it's the other one I can think of you kind of create these these an agency would have words. to be yeah oh well, yeah. Words, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> um, I mean, I wonder yeah, if there is, definitely. if there I mean, is a, like to feel like it's in... yeah, I, I agree. Doc. Yeah, what do we need to do apart from make all clients and all agency staff read your book? Um, is, the, is there uh, <laughs> is, is there anything else we could do? Is, is it? Um, or do you think that's just the way the industry is? Well, I actually do think it's interesting that there seems to have been a bit of a res resurgence of smaller agencies and or independent agencies. Perhaps perhaps small is not the right word, but you know, thinking about mischief and um, some of those agencies in the in the states and so on. Yeah. Um, I you know I, I wonder if there is a bit of a trend towards um, clients appreciating the value of of smaller agencies and perhaps perhaps that kind of lack of hierarchy and complication and so on. Um, I don't know if you've found that, Giles. I think, yeah, I think you're definitely onto something. And yeah, definitely Greg Greg and his team at Mischief deserve a shout out. Absolutely. But I think, I think um, you know, there's there's a scale, isn't there? Some people would fiercely agree with you and some would, some would oppose you. Yeah. Um, I think there's, I think there's huge advantages. And I think that independence perhaps of getting more recognition i i also think that it's worth um stressing if we're talking about agencies a lot of the problems that are called out in the book and were previously called out five thousand years ago with delusions um <laughs> they're they're not they're not the fault of the client as much as they are the agency i i believe and and whilst this won't make me many friends which is consistent <laughs> Um, in agency <laughs> lands, I I think that uh, I think agencies need to kind of stand up for themselves a bit more, and that's always really easy to do when you've got, I suppose, the privileged stance of I'm not going to lose my job for doing that. So there's all sorts of human behavioural factors that come into this, and it's not as simple as I'm going to make it sound. But whether you're talking about pitching freely, giving away ideas, working late nights, working weekends, I spoke to a guy who's at a very big, probably the most known agency globally recently. And he said, don't worry, Giles, they don't make me do Zoom calls to clients at the weekend now. As if like that was some amazing benefit. And I was just like, mate, what? This, this, this is the wrong, this environment is so dangerous for so many reasons that we need to take responsibility for getting out of it. And I think where independents come into it to kind of try and loop it back to your point, Ryan, is independents are able to make and implement those decisions or have those conversations quicker than you possibly could in a big network or holding company where there's you know thousands of people that need to sign off of that particular stance but i think independence will there'll be there'll be huge benefits to the independents who survive this kind of process that we i believe are going through at the moment makes a lot of sense yeah i mean they're, they're yep. great the other ones that um, but i think that i think like... that is a good it's a good point they Sorry, I was just going to say it's a good point that you make about, you know, I, I don't, and I don't think that we really have done this in the book is is to have a pop at clients, and it's something that I try mm -hmm. not to do, <laughs> um, you know, because they're our lifebloods, and and also mm -hmm. and also not at at customers, um, which I think is one of the things that our industry can do a lot of, um, so that's really something that I think we try and avoid. So you know. Just have a go at our right. colleagues. <laughs> favorite client you've ever, yeah. the favorite client you've ever worked with, then Ryan. My ah uh, you... well, so interestingly <laughs> enough, it's someone someone that I am currently working with on a global campaign, um, which is very unusual for our agency because we're obviously you know we're a small independent agency in Melbourne, on the other side of the world. Um, but uh, she's been a client through three different companies that she's worked for and just 
I've, I've actually spoken about her on on a podcast before. She's um, just the dream client in many ways. Like, you know, she briefs well. She will. It's collaborative. She will fight for the for the work that we put forward if she believes in it. Um, you know, just and 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 it's been the result is that it's been the best work that we've done basically for the last few years. So, you know, it really is all those things that make it make a client great. Mm. I can't disclose because it's all pharma related. So, <laughs> no worries. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm allowed to talk about She that. sounds amazing. Yeah, she's really good. Yeah. <laughs> and any 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 favourites really. from your side, Charles? Oh, it's difficult to choose a favourite without upsetting uh, others. So <laughs> I think the there's 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 two current clients that we have, and what I love about the reason these two stand out for me is they're just they couldn't be well. It would be different difficult for them to be any more kind of different from each other. So one is uh, a, a big London law firm. Uh, I can call them out called Adelshaw Goddard. Um, and I should say that they just won one of the most, I suppose, sought after prizes uh, at the Marketing Week Awards, which was they won Best Marketing Team, which is is them. Mm. It's recognition of them, not us. Um, I believe we're their agency of note, or that was called out on the night. But I mean, honestly, that you couldn't ask for better clients. They're constantly pushing creative boundaries, and are absolutely. They're led by a guy called Brian McCready, and he is just exactly the person you want in your corner when you're doing anything. The other one that I want to call out quickly, and why I love them so much, is a business, <laughs> and it shows the kind of weird places we find ourselves in as an agency. They are in the goods, not for resale. Uh, industry which i had never heard of but to summarize it as easily as i can they every they sell everything that isn't for sale in a retail environment so their biggest seller is those small little size cubes you get on hangers in clothing stores i never <laughs> thought about who did that so that's yeah. a fascinating well, one. They, fascinating just one. Yeah. they just get laid right so yeah I, I, and i love I think the guys at Tracksuit, who I spoke to recently, would call it a sweaty business because um, it certainly is. But I just, I, I, I find that sort of stuff bizarrely interesting. I, see. I, I mean, I think yeah. that's that's where you often find the most amazing like excuses for creative work as well. I mean, I, I know one of my friends, one of the richest people I know, had, uh, makes cardboard boxes. It's just like, such a random industry, you know, not sexy, not glamorous, but yeah. everyone. Yeah, cobble boxes are everywhere. Um, so if you make a good machine for those, yeah, you know, it's like millions and millions and yeah. millions and millions. What's the what's um, the what's the saying? There's no such no such thing as a boring product. Only only boring creative. I think so. I no, I I, I always admire true, that yeah. when when you hear people saying you know they they yeah. they'd rather on their portfolio put forward uh, you know, I don't know like a loop loop paper brand or something or a washing up liquid rather than a condom brand or something that sells. Uh, Nike or yeah, cool, yeah, Apple or or whatever. Um, mm. Yeah, it's amazing. There's there's probably beauty to be had in that. I wonder whether there's a whole kind of can you make an agency uh, um, persona around that that kind of industry? I don't. I don't it's so, so hard to find them because often they don't do any marketing because they're <laughs> they're uh, they're bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Good fun to work on those things. So definitely, I think I think we need to. I think as an industry, though, Chris, we need to spend more time looking into the work that happens with those types of businesses. Yeah. I think there's um, there's a guy who uh, works. I think he's managing partner at Contagious, who I'm sure you're both familiar with. Yeah. And we were talking about. I I said something in hindsight that I think was quite unfair to him, which was at their event they've got big brands like um, is it Math Metal Metal behind Barbie McDonald's. Yeah. See all these big brands, and 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 I, and I, I unfairly referenced a brilliant tweet I saw recently where someone had said, "I wish we had a logo like Nike's," and someone very, I mean, it sounds like it could have been Ryan. It's the sort of thing you'd reply with, mate. And someone said, "All you need is a simple icon, eighty years of fifty values? billion yeah. pounds worth of advertising," and it was just like <laughs> there's so much truth in that statement. And I think we would learn more if we looked at the brands that don't benefit off this historical you know, work that's been ploughed into that brand for years and years and years and zooming in so closely on something that McDonald's or Apple might have done. It's like, well, no, no, let's look at the cardboard box business that your mate runs, Chris, and understand how he's made a success of that. And I think that's where 
we probably need to spend a bit more time as an industry. Yeah. I'm going way off topic. Yeah, it's a real halo <laughs> effect, though, I think, with those big brands. I agree. Well, and as, as the guy fairly said back to me, it's like going to Glastonbury. People go for the big name brands, right, and the big bands. So, you know, you put me in my place, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make, makes sense. Um, but uh, look, I mean, so congratulations again on this fantastic book. <laughs> it's, I know uh, we've not got much more time yet, so I'll, uh, I'll try and wrap it up. But um, any uh, any par- parting words of advice uh, or uh, words of wisdom from you, Ryan? Um, you're you're a, you're a great man with words. Um, congratulations on a fantastic book. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> Why to put me on the spot? Um, no, I don't have any words of wisdom apart from apart from being Just read the book, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well yeah. done. It's it's lovely. And congrats, Charles, so on thank your you. uh, your incredible design skills. It is. You know what? It's a bit. Well, it's not extraordinary, but that's really kind. I'll take that. It's uh, it's one of those things where I think the only metaphor I can come up with, if if it's almost like a joke. So Ryan's written these amazingly brilliant jokes. And then it's up to me to tell the joke. And I think that's what I was just frozen for three years thinking. I don't know how to, I don't know how to do any credit. Uh, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's, you know, close enough or as close as I could get. But um, just to just to finish, Chris, it is a, it's available from the 15th, um, which I think it's Wednesday. Yeah, and it's available uh, from Amazon. It's also available from Waterstones and people who don't dodge their corporation taxes, as far <laughs> as I know. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's a perfect gift for Christmas. So anyone who's uh, looking for something uh, for for an advertising or marketing friend or fan or lover in their life, uh, how brands grow, uh, go and get it. Uh, <laughs> loads of love to you both, and thank you so much for taking the time out. And uh, I hope you have uh, a fantastic rest of the year. Um, and thank you so much for for putting together this this book that. Yeah, made me laugh a lot and uh, taught me some stuff too. So uh, yeah, I hope hope, uh, hope you make the next one in uh, three months' time, <laughs> rather than three years. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah, all the very best. Nice Cheers, it.